When is a parent born? When your world changes in a moment? Nani! Or when the moment is celebrated by all? When you start learning again? Or with a new rule? Is it your child's first breath? Is it just a feeling? Parents are born when they fulfill a responsibility. Your child's umbilical cord blood can provide protection from 80 life-threatening diseases. Keep it safe with Asia's largest stem cell bank. Cord Life. One chance, one choice. Well, hello everyone. A very warm welcome and a good afternoon to all the joiners. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. I hope you and your family members are doing well and uh, taking good care of uh, themselves during this pandemic. Please stay safe. Keep your, using your mask. That's very important. Now, today I am here. My name is Priyanka Shahi. I will be your host for today. Um, before we proceed for the webinar, I request you to get a bottle of water, get some snacks if you wish, and make yourself comfortable because we will be moving on to our topic that is an overview of stem cell banking and its utility. Well, um, we keep on hearing about stem cells from different sources, but often do not have the access to the right kind of info, and it further creates more confusion. We at Cord Life realize this. And hence, we brought to you this significant topic for today's discussion. We really hope we would be able to satisfy all your questions and queries regarding this lesser known yet important subject. It is even more important for people who are going to be parents soon. I would recommend please ask your other family members to join as well. It will help all to have an in-depth knowledge. At the same time, this will help you take the right decision at the right time. During this session, if you have any queries or questions, feel free to send, in, send them to us. After the discussion with doctor, we will take utmost care to answer all your queries. Now it is high time to introduce the expert himself. Please welcome Dr. Prashanta Chaudhary, a gold medalist and a pioneer in the field of hemoglobinopathy with over 27 years of experience and expertise. In fact, he is the first Indian to complete master's in hemoglobinopathy from University College London. He has an extensive training and experience in cord blood and stem cell research from the University of Milan, Italy. So a very warm welcome and thank you for taking the time out to join us today and agreeing to help us understand the otherwise considered complex, but of course, important subject. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Thank you for the kind words, Priyanka. Uh, I never really imagined that my CV would be sounding this way. But anyway, that's that's what it is. You know, actually, when I came back from Milan, I was at a loss to uh, to understand the dynamics of the uh, Indian market as regards cord blood banking. But lucky, I joined Cord Life in 2006 and being instrumental in uh, making the lab myself with my own two hands validating the procedures and again uh, doing educational stuff and all that so thank you very much let's see what our uh, listeners want to shoot for us let us answer those yes. questions and i yes, guess uh, i also like to reiterate that uh, both of us are sitting here without masks i think our oh, yes. uh, audience are also sitting without masks what yeah because about? we hope they are at home request you to uh, observe COVID appropriate behavior otherwise and take your vaccines. So, okay, please go ahead. Shoot. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Um, it was wonderful hearing your expert advices. Please, uh, audiences, please do follow. And now um, I'll begin with a more basic question, which is, I'm sure, in everybody's mind what exactly is a stem cell? Mm, okay. Uh, 
Uh, a stem cell is like uh, many people say it's a mother cell, it's a primitive cell. But you know, the stem cell is actually the cell from which all the other cells and organ systems of our body has been created. And to say that there are more than 200 types of cell cells in our body that composes different organs and all of them originated from a single cell. So this cell is the stem cell. I mean, D means capital D, the stem cell. But uh, that really doesn't answer your question, does it? It's becoming more scientific. Okay. Yeah. Let's take it this way. Uh, you take a green sapling. A sapling is a stem, right? So this right. stem, if you put it into a proper uh, soil, which is manured, you water it properly, expose it to the sunlight, it grows the roots at the bottom, it grows the branches on top. And these right. branches then spread out to bear leaves, flowers, fruit, seed. The seed again falls to the ground and it gives rise to more such trees. So a stem cell is like that seed, but the life or the potency of that seed was there in the stem also. So this is where the word stem cell came from. In fact, the word stem cell was coined by a Russian uh, cell uh, specialist, cytologist, by the name of Dr. Alexander Maximov way back in 1870. So from back, this particular concept came in and he thought that the entire uh, organism may be a human being, may be an animal, may be whatever, anything that is living, uh, mm -hmm. actually originated from one cell. And, you know, the peculiar part of it is that uh, whoever you believe as the creator, maybe nature, maybe God, whoever you believe in, has been uh, very, very instrumental, has been very good because all these organ systems, when they were built, there has been small residual amount of stem cells which have been left behind in entire organ system of the body. And this organ system, it works like a machine. It works from the birth to death. So this entire cycle from birth to death, an organ functions incessantly. So while this functioning is going on, there is chance that due to wear and tear, there will be a bit of a loss of function. So to make up for this loss of function, these stem cells are there in various nests or niches within these organs, which are protected. And whenever there's a requirement of an organ to rejuvenate, regenerate a particular part, which has been lost or which is not functioning properly due to daily wear and tear, this goes and makes it up. So that is how the body's entire organ system is maintained in such a way. That okay. is the uh, that, that is the essence, that is the peculiarity of a stem cell. And we don't realize it. You, know, you are breathing, your heart is beating. Do you realize it? No. It silently, it silently goes on rebuilding your body. It, re it just makes up for those losses silently. So it's a very silent worker. It's like your mother, you know, who cooks for you, who does washings for you, like for you, me. Sorry, my mother isn't around. But when he, when she was around, she used to do it. So uh, mm -hmm. that is how that is how it is. So and no problem in calling uh, a stem cell a mother cell also, because every mother gives rise to two daughters. The daughter in time matures and becomes a mother, and they give rise to daughters. So this multiplication capacity of a stem cell from a mother to daughter cells, daughter becoming mothers and giving rise to daughters. So there is propagation of a generation. So that is also true for a stem cell. Right. So just to recap, uh, stem cells are basic building blocks of our body, our tissues. I, I don't think I can hear you properly. Could you speak a bit louder, okay. please? Okay, sure. So um, what he meant is that, just to recap, um, would it be correct to say that stem cells are the building blocks of our entire existence? Yes, absolutely. Cells, right. And they also have the tendency to further regenerate and differentiate into more complex organs, yes. right? It's like, uh, it's like, you know, you have a building which has been made. The right. building is made of small bricks. The mm -hmm. bricks compose the walls. So to me, these bricks are the cells. The right. walls, you put it together and you make four walls that becomes a room. So a room mm -hmm. becomes an organ. Now you've got plenty of rooms put together in a building, so the building becomes a body. 
So that is how you should conceive it. And at the same time, you know, I have been giving this example to lots of my listeners long ago uh, mm -hmm. when I used to take regular eyeball to eyeball seminars. So uh, you have you seen the mud in the Ganges? In the right. Ganges, we get the mud. You know? The mud, that silt that we take up. Imagine mm -hmm. that silt is made very delicately into the image of a Durga. Mm -hmm. It's that mud. The brick that you use to build your house is again made from that mud. The cooler in which you drink tea while you're out somewhere is again made from that mud. So that mud is the step cell. Okay. But, and again, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sir, I was just refilling it so that our audiences can understand. And you know, you have beautifully put it together and simplified it so that it's it's easy to understand by everybody. Uh, so it's basically the building blocks and also have the capabilities, like you've just given an example of uh, the mud, the soil, which can be shaped into different uh, further shapes and could be uh, made one mitti chai ka kulhar, or we can you know make bricks all as well, which is so hard that can break anybody's bones. And at the same time, we can make uh, the, uh, any you know goddesses, gods or goddesses idols that we create. So it has got all the capabilities of forming different shapes and sizes, and uh, different enable, different functions. Right, enable different functions correctly. So, okay, so we are born with it. Our body uh, transitions, and then what happens? Uh, do do I have? Yeah, like to me, correct you here. You said we are born with it. I right. would like to connect that. We are oh. born from it. We are oh. born from it because a ovum and a sperm uniting and becoming a small single cell. That cell divides. That cell we call an embryo. Right. Okay. That embryo is supposed to then divide amongst itself to form a molecular. That cell then gives rise to the whole body. So, you know, rather we having it, we are it. We are it. Right. Hmm. Makes sense. Next question. So, even today, uh, of course, as you mentioned, you know, we are born, we, it, it is born with us or, you know, formed with us. Um, in present scenario, in an adult body, uh, do I have any particular source right now in my body where the stem cells are present? Yeah, I know. I, be, I become irritated of stem cells, you know. Every day I cut my beard and I shave my beard and it grows. So, I mean, stem cells are there on my skin, which is supposed oh. to be growing my beard. Here you cut, it grows. So, it's from the stem. In fact, each and every part of the body has got stem cells. Each and every even, part. Even the when... An adult? In an adult. Oh. Till death. Even even oh. after a person is dead, the skin cells still grow. The hair still grows. So it is there in each and every body and each and every part of the body. In fact, our tears contain stem cells. Urine stool contains stem cells. So the excreta also contains stem cells. But the, dif the, the uh, difference is, uh, I mean, a stem cell to subserve a particular function, it is taken for granted that it has to reside in a particular organ. It has to stay inside an organ. Okay. So that is the that is the thought. That is what people think. But it is present in every one of our every part of the body. Okay. So that's uh, something new for all of us. Because you know, we keep hearing about it, we always think it's something specialized and it's not. It's present in some specific organs only. But thank you so much for uh, helping us with the right knowledge. Now, if it is already present in my body, then why worry about you know storing or banking? Why do we hear keep hearing such words? Excellent thought. You know, there are uh, wear and tear related damages happening every second. To each and every part of our body's organs. 
and these stem cells which reside within these organs we call them the resident stem cells because they are there they are housed in that particular organ and okay. they regenerate that particular organ only but the storehouse of these stem cells are limited so they have got a limited capacity till which they can cope up with the regeneration due to wear and tear that is required what about if there is an injury what about if there is an insult which overwhelms the capacity of the resident stem cells to regenerate or rejuvenate that particular organ it might be due to a damage it might be due to a disease it might be due to plenty of things okay, okay. so it's it's not like if i cut if i get a cut here mm -hmm. the skin will heal it is going to get joint right but if i cut my hand will it grow no because this injury is too much for the resident stem cells to regenerate so okay. that is the essence that is where it requires help okay when a help is required at mm -hmm. that point of time if you can if you can supply stem cells the stem mm -hmm. cell will go to that particular part it will mm -hmm. mold itself according to the requirement and then it will try to help body's own regeneration process it will not try to help it will help in the body's own regeneration process right okay. so okay. it's like you go to a school you get taught certain mm -hmm. things but there are certain problems which might not have had been solved in school so you go to take a tuition most of us have done it that is to enhance our knowledge which mm -hmm. we haven't been able to grasp where we are supposed to do it like the thing might have been overwhelming or our capacity might be limited depends on both sides but we take a tuition to enhance our knowledge on that topic so when the body's regeneration inherent regeneration capacity is overwhelmed and it cannot regenerate the part which has been lost or compromised due to a disease or disorder that is where the help is required okay so sir okay in case of an emergency then what am i supposed to do if i need the treatment using a stem cell uh, for an emergency so sir right what the source is okay uh, you know uh, the first such attempt uh, had happened long back uh, it it happened uh, somewhere in the uh, 1968 or something like that when uh, a, a scientist come doctor uh, he attempted to uh, cure cancer blood cancer and mm -hmm. he thought that if blood cancer uh, you know what blood cancer is right or should i explain it Oh, if you can explain for us, that cancer is a is a cancer we all know. Cancer is a is a disease or a disorder in which there is a very quick generation of cells, very quick generation of cells, and the cells don't die. So this is what is known as a cancer or a malignancy. And if a cancer or a malignancy happens in blood, blood is composed of four things one is the liquid tissue that is the plasma in which all mm -hmm. the cells or the corpus cells of the blood float it's made into a suspension there are red cells white cells and platelets so combination of any of the malignancies of the red cells white cells platelets or plasma mm -hmm. are generally categorized as blood cancers it's in a broad in a broad sense but there again re, uh, small small classifications i won't go to the details of it so yeah. he said that if the bone marrow i mean blood is again formed in the in the uh, cavity of the long bones the long bones that we have in our hands or in our legs these bones have got a pipe or an empty pipe inside uh, i mean people who are non vegetarians have taken mutton and that time they put that hole into the mouth and then they suck out that soft portion spongy portion within a bone that is the bone marrow which is reddish in color which actually forms blood all the all the uh, components of blood so if there are can if there is a cancer there if there is a malignancy there so the best way to kill the malignancy is just exterminate the entire bone marrow kill the entire bone marrow and after killing the bone marrow you repopulate the bone marrow with a living bone marrow good bone marrow from someone else mm -hmm. i 
go to the uh, details later. So this was the logic. Okay. And what he did was, Dr. Donald Thomas, uh, sorry, it's not Dr. Thomas, I'll, I'll remember the name later on possibly. So what he did was, he did a transplant in which the cells were taken from the bone marrow and it was given to another person whose entire bone marrow was got rid of using uh -huh. chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And this person survived. Okay. So the first source of stem cell where it was used due to a disease uh -huh. was by this person, by Dr. Donald Thomas. And he got a Nobel Prize for it in 1988. So the scientific community took 20 years to realize what his contribution was. So the first source of stem cells mm -hmm. was that it was extracted from the bone marrow. Bone. It's a very hard substance. So if you want to extract the bone marrow, it is, it's got a very, very painful procedure. You know, my index finger is here. This index, it's the needle size is double my index finger. Maybe not this thick, but it is thicker. Mm. And it is supposed to be pierced. It is supposed to be like screwed into the small of your back. Okay. Yeah, your, your, your facial expression actually is telling everything. Yeah, it is excruciatingly painful. Each side, each backside is actually pierced 20 to 30 times to get the adequate number of bone marrow harvest. And at that point of time, the person is put under general anesthesia that the person doesn't feel the pain. But once the person wakes up, it's very painful. You know, I have extracted bone marrow myself. Mm -hmm. Once I was there standing, extracting the bone marrow, it was way back in 1999, then 2000, 2001, I have been doing these extractions. When I have been doing these extractions, you know, if the physical stress of putting this needle into the bone, actually used to render us in sweats there has to be there were three or four of us who were doing it in turn so think of the pressure and the trauma that this person from whom the bone marrow was extracted was going through and the pain number okay. one so it made people think can there be some alternative to bone marrow that is where they blocked upon Mm -hmm. These kind of cells that we get from the bone marrow also escape into the blood that is flowing through our veins. So why don't we take it from the veins? That is a procedure known as leukapheresis. In leukapheresis, you put a person under a machine. And mm -hmm. then there is a pipe which goes into one vein. Another mm -hmm. pipe goes into another vein. So this machine is programmed in such a way that it sucks out your blood. It separates the WBCs of the stem cells in a receptacle and rest of the blood is returned through the other pipe. So this is known as a leukapheresis or you can do a stem cell pheresis. Okay. But the person now has to get injections such that certain injections which is given three days or for five days which is in the form of mole grass stream or field grass stream. These, mm -hmm. these are based or uh, uh, plexi flawed, what happens is these injections actually mobilize the stem cells from the bone marrow to the peripheral. It just uh, drives the cells away from the bone marrow so that we get more concentration of stem cells in the peripheral. Why mm -hmm. did this question have to arise? Because, for example, an, uh, an ml of bone marrow, mm -hmm. certain amount of bone marrow, if it contains 100 cells, proportionately, that amount of Peripheral blood will contain only one stem cell. So you want to push more stem cells into the peripheral blood. So the proportion of stem cells in the bone marrow is 100, whereas that is for peripheral blood it is 1. And this person has to take this injection for 5 days, 4-5 days, 3 days and has to sit or make himself available on this instrument for about 3-5 to five days to collect enough of stem cells which is good for therapy. Then people started thinking, I mean, can I not do away with these two painful things? Where a scientist from United States by the name of Dr. Hal Broxmeyer, he was doing research with cells which were spent, which were there in the umbilical cord. What is an umbilical cord? 
after a baby is born the baby is attached to the mother through a through the placenta the yeah. placenta actually is the is the uh, organ through which all the blood and blood nutrients including carbon dioxide including oxygen is okay. goes into the into the child circulation in the fetal circulation and from the fetal circulation the excretory products and the carbon dioxide also goes out so it is a lifeline so have you seen uh, glen glen in a space craft you know what glen is famous for he did the first space walk you know the space walk so when he did the space walk he was actually connected to yes. a space station through a pipe called the umbilical cord so this is the connection between the mother and the fetus peculiarly blood initially is not made in the baby blood is initially made in the placenta so the cells actually get transported from the placenta through the umbilical cord which is the conduit which is the pipe to the baby and this transfer goes on till the baby is born and the pulsation the pulse that we have the same pulse we can have on the umbilical cord when the pulsation ceases the transfer stops and then what we do is we clamp the cord at the fetal end cut it and make the fetus separate that the now we call it the baby and this particular cord and the placenta with the coverings that is the amniotic membrane is actually taken out of the mother and it is known as after why is it known as the after birth because it comes after the birth of the baby and then it is thrown into the dustbin he actually had an idea that that amount of blood which stays back in the umbilical cord and the placenta should be able to suffice with the blood components that we today use for transfusion like red cells platelets and others but he found out that the amount of the cells that are there in the placenta and the cord is not good enough for a transfusion but while doing this research he found out that the, there are lot of stem cells which are present in this blood and the proportion is in between peripheral blood and bone marrow bone marrow might contain 100 stem cells for a particular volume for that particular volume the peripheral blood will contain one stem cell but the umbilical cord will contain 10 stem cells so that is why that is when people thought yes we can do it so ultimately dr elian blackman from mm -hmm. france she did the first umbilical cord blood transplant on a child who was suffering from a particular type of blood cancer known as fanconi's anemia and the blood was collected and processed by dr hal broxmeyer and it was done in saint louis hospital in paris and after that everything has become history that was the point when it was proved that the umbilical cord blood is as good as the bone marrow and as good as the peripheral blood now we see about 50000 transplantations happening all over the world but that started with that one event in 1988 okay so this is so now practically speaking expendable source of stem cell i mean what we can uh, expend what we can usable source of stem cells there are plenty things are coming out slowly but quote and quote the, the source of stem cells that we still use today are right. derived from only three of these sources one is the bone marrow second is the peripheral blood third is the okay. umbilical cord okay okay and out of all these umbilical cord blood uh extraction again i'm having a bit of a problem hearing you again i'm having okay. a bit of a problem yeah okay can you hear me now yes yes Yes, I'm extremely sorry to the viewers and to you as well if uh, the audio was not good. Now, um, I, what I was asking is that you know, out of all the three major sources that you have just uh, helped us understand, um, umbilical cord blood seems to be, or umbilical cord seems to be the most easiest one to collect. Please correct me if I am wrong. No, I mean. Uh... it's a waste it's a waste you know uh, if you go to the people in the biological waste management cell unfortunately the placenta and cord there's a picture of placenta and cord which shows it's a biological waste right if you can, if you can collect something which is a waste i mean the baby's cord has been cut and the baby is separate 
the mother has delivered and the mother and this is just an organ which was there so before throwing it into the dustbin you clean a part of the cord stick a needle to it and the blood flows into your blood bag that's all and once it is collected i mean who is going to feel the pain not the mother because the uh-huh. mother not the baby because the baby has been delivered not the right. mother because the mother has also delivered the afterwards so right. there is no question of feeling pain anywhere and number two most important is it's a waste it doesn't yeah. it, it doesn't involve an extra procedure mm-hmm. that means you want to go to the ot anesthetize a person uh, put in those needles and make things very painful the person recovers in 5 to 7 days or neither do you want another person to take 2 to 3 uh, to 5 injections and then mm-hmm. sit on an instrument for again another 3 to 5 days uh, to get the harvest so this yeah. is so, there should be any controversy about umbilical cord blood being the uh, the why should i be talking about pain i mean it doesn't involve pain at all yeah right right okay so sir just now we were talking about the stem cells how it can help us in treat many diseases and disorders like you mentioned blood cancer are there more diseases can you uh, elaborate on that can you help us understand number of other diseases and you know the types of diseases that could be treated uh mostly you know today as of now if you tell me what diseases can be treated today right i'll categorize it under uh, three groups one is the textbook treatment group that means the treatment which is there in the textbooks and which is possible and has been done time and time and again right all the malignancies of the blood all the cancers of the blood that is the all the leukemias mm-hmm. Lymphomas and multiple myelomas. I mean, leukemias again. I told you are the cancers or the malignancies of the uh, red cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Cancer of the other type of immune cells is known as plasma cell dyscrasias, and uh, these are fall under multiple myelomas and a certain type of lymphomas, which is a cancer of the lymphoid organs. Mm-hmm. these three can be done straight away so this is the malignancy group okay next is the pseudo malignancy group where a person can turn malignant cannot turn malignant but a particular part or all three types of bloods are not being made by the bone marrow those we put under something known as hypoplastic or aplastic anemias or myelodysplastic disorders or myelodys myelodysplastic syndromes they can also be cured through stem cell transplantation where we we can use amlek what is the third third is those defect defects which comes to me firstly comes to my mind is the thalassemia sickle cell disorders the hemoglobin apathies they have got defects in hemoglobin so these defects in hemoglobin they have to take very regular transfusions so to end those transfusions today the best thing is to go for a stem cell transplant so cancer non formation of blood and blood related tissue third is mm-hmm. malformation of blood all these three things can be cured through doing stem cell transplant what else can you do there are diseases of the immune system adenosine deaminase deficiency severe combined immunodeficiency these can also be cured through stem cell transplant so that is the umbilical cord blood stem cell transplant okay. what about so this is the therapy which is happening today which is happening here which is happening now Mm-hmm. there are certain things which are also being tried tried means these are there have been clinical trials which are going on first the clinical trial happened to see if it has any bad side effect once there it was shown that it doesn't have any side effect it was done to see if it has any beneficial effects what are those disorders there are four disorders which is got which are falling under this category number 1 is cerebral palsy cerebral palsy we know that due to low oxygen in the brain a part of the brain dies or just uh, does cannot function so the child has got a uh, brain compromise neurological compromise so that child that can be treated through using umbilical cord blood stem cells second is autistic spectrum disorder though we don't clearly know the etiology of autistic spectrum disorder 
but yet it has been shown that plenty of traits of autistic spectrum disorder improve when you treat them using umbilical cord blood stem cell. What is the third one? Third one is type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, again, clinical trials are going on very aggressively and it has shown good promise. Number four, heart disorders known as cardiomyopathies. These are also being tried under clinical trials. So this is the clinical trial. Next, there are certain concepts. Mm -hmm. The concepts have been proved in animal models, but yet to find its place in the human trials. What are those? If there is an injury, to your spinal cord. Right. That means the spinal cord which is there, which connects your whole body to the brain. If there is any injury or there is any transaction, that can be cured using stem cell. It has been successful in animal models. The regeneration of cartilage, the knee cartilage, the hip, these can also be possible. It has been again proved in animal models. It has not been done in humans. There are certain disorders of the immune system known as multiple sclerosis, where the body's own immune system thinks body's own system as foreign and starts destroying it. Mm -hmm. that, that is also being attempted. And last one, which I can tell you is, there are plenty of clinical trials going on for COVID. For COVID-related lung injury, okay. trials are going on. I mean, few, few trials are going on where it is being attempted to regenerate the lung tissue. But again, let me reiterate, people uh -huh. hearing me, please do not take these therapies which I mentioned in the third category as these treatments are available. No, these are not available as treatments, neither as clinical trials. These are treatments of the future. Okay, so these are basically the categories in under which the treatment is possible today. And you break up the entire leukemias and lymphomas, it is going to form about 80 types of disorders. You take the others, it's possibly going to come to about 120. So according to the, uh, the authorities, there are possibly mm -hmm. about 120 disorders today, which can be treated using umbilical cord blood stem cells. Wow, that's really great to learn. Okay. Achyam, sir, if you see cord blood stem cells, the cells are so valuable and the process is so painless, risk-free, so safe to do, why people are not doing it in, and instead they are choosing to throw it away? What do you think could be the reason? Firstly, you know, there is total lack of awareness, complete lack of awareness. I don't think not even a percent of the population knows what mm -hmm. umbilical cord blood is, what do we do with it, number one. Right. Number two. Uh, there has been quack cures. Quack cures mean people will tell you that if you put the baldness on the top of your head, you apply umbilical cord blood and it's going to grow hair. Doesn't happen. So there has been certain misconceptions which have been sold. These, this is this is the product of very cheap marketing. This cheap marketing gimmicks have actually thrown cord blood into disrepute. Right. So these two things taken together is very important. Because if people are not aware, in fact, I can tell you, uh, mm -hmm. the, the the general people who would be hearing this this kind of discourse, this kind of uh, discussion, will know right. about stem cells. There will be plenty of people, plenty of doctors, technical people who might be there, who might mm -hmm. not possess the correct knowledge. And, you know, uh, if there is one, one anti-propaganda, Mm -hmm. That's going to spread like wildfire. Like I told you, I have critically categorized the therapy under three heads. Mm -hmm. The third head, where it is an animal trial, animal mm -hmm. trial can show, show plenty of things. Tomorrow, this thing, will it be translated into something of worth in humans or not, is yet to be seen. But people will, will try to project, see, mm -hmm. this is possible using umbilical cord blood. No, umbilical cord blood is not the Amrit. Hmm. It's not the Amrit. It's not that, uh, what should I say? Other than Amrit, I cannot think of another word. This okay. Amrit is supposed to be, huh? Sanjeevani, can we call it? Sanjeevani, yeah. Sanj it, it, it cannot be like the Sanjeevani, you just take it. Or the, the Miracurol tablet, which was uh, discovered by Professor Shunku, uh, who uh, our great Satyajit Ray had 
uh, the character, the, the, sci the right. scientist character, which was created by Chatitre. It's nothing like that. It cannot cure all your ills. But there has to be a rational approach. What we, what we don't understand or what we don't do, there are two things which are very badly responsible. One mm -hmm. is lack of awareness and second mm -hmm. is irresponsible marketing. Mm -hmm. These two things have killed this particular, uh, what should I say, uh, the, the, potent, the most potent uh, source of stem cells that we have. Not, but not only potent, I mean most available also. Most available. Yeah. Could you elaborate on the process of how the cord blood is collected and how the stem cells are extracted and for how long can you restore this? The stem cell is, as I told you, that uh, the umbilical cord blood, you know, there is a specific temperature at which you're supposed to collect it in a special bag. So after okay. the baby is delivered and separated, the mother, uh, after the cord uh, stops pulsating, mm -hmm. That means the transfer of the blood from the placenta and cord to the baby has, has stopped. Then you clamp the cord. After you have clamped the cord, the baby is separated. Then you visually inspect the cord to see a good thick vein, which can be identified. You clean that vein with antiseptic material which is given. Then you pierce that vein using a needle which is collected to a bag. It is like a normal blood collection bag that we, every time when we donate blood, it's something like that. So it is that bag, but it is meant for cord blood collection. So okay. the volume of that is low. It already contains a preformed liquid in it, which is supposed to make the blood remain in liquid form after collection. The blood doesn't clot. So you put the needle in and you wait. So through gravity, this blood flows into the bag. Once no more blood flows, you can milk the cord, you can squeeze the cord. Some people see if there is a top turgid vein up near the placenta. You clean that portion, take out this needle and you can reinsert it. And then the whole harvest of the umbilical cord is complete. After this harvest, you sterile, in a sterile way, you tie the, uh, the, 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 the pipe so that the blood cannot leak out, label it properly, cut the needle off, dispose it in a way it is supposed to be disposing off with the shops. After that, you collect the mother's blood. Why do you collect the mother's blood? Because to us, physiologically, the mother and the baby is the same physiological system. So if you test certain things in the mother, it actually reflects the same status in the baby. So there are certain disease status like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, uh, then syphilis, malaria, HTLV, cytomegalovirus, all these tests are done on the maternal. So now you collect the maternal blood and then you keep two of them separate. Remember, the maternal blood has to be collected separately before the mother is put on any fluids or any saline or something because otherwise the saline is going to come into the body. It is going to dilute that particular thing that we are looking for in the blood sample that we've taken. So that might give rise to false negative results. That is point one. Point two is the maternal blood is supposed to be carried at a lower temperature before it is tested. That temperature is between 4 to 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. The cord blood can be transported between 4 to 37 degrees Celsius. So we've got a bag which has got a double compartment box. In the double compartment box, one compartment keeps the umbilical cord blood. The second compartment keeps the maternal blood. And then it is transported in this thermoneutral box. Very important this box can not be x-rayed because the stem cells are very sensitive to x-ray they'll get destroyed either they'll dry either they'll die or they'll undergo a malignant transformation so we won't even know if that cell has undergone a malignant transformation we'll get it if it is dead but we cannot detect a malignant transformation so at the end of the day if it comes through an x-ray it is very important to check that a transportation of an umbilical cord blood is happening with a no x-ray permit. Very important. So it comes in, in the special box, it reaches the laboratory. Upon reaching the laboratory, all the criteria which it should fulfill is checked. Then the maternal blood is taken to the maternal blood testing unit and the cord blood is taken to the processing unit. In the processing unit, the, the, this particular bag in a very sterile way is connected to a processing bag. 
what we generally do is we have got an automated extraction system so we automatically extract the stem cells from that cord blood why do we want to extract because the cord blood by virtue of being blood it contains red cells white cells platelets and plasma but what we are interested in is that white cell portion which contains the stem cells okay so what we do is we get rid of the things that we don't want and we concentrate the stem cells in a volume of 25 ml so whatever be the harvest yeah if it is 250 ml also the ultimately it will be stored as a 25 ml bag once that contains more stem cells will appear as if it is very thick once that contains a bit less stem cell will appear lighter so it is the plasma a bit of plasma and the stem cells are mixed together after that we inject something into it which is known as a cryoprotectant because we are going to store this umbilical cord blood derived stem cells at a very low temperature i mean at an embarrassingly low temperature so it has to protect itself at that that temperature so it is stored in the vapor phase of liquid nitrogen at below minus 190 degrees celsius to be specific at minus 196 degrees celsius you know how cold that is I can't. If you hold an ice cube in your hand, yes. for how much time would you be able to hold it? Not even two three minutes. It's so cold, right? Right. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Zero. Now imagine something to be around two hundred times that coldness. Okay. So it's very cold. It's very cold. So it's cold right. in that. So we slowly bring the temperature down, and that is how it is stored in a specific. Uh, in a specific place in a in a tank and once there is a requirement then we can take it out and then transport it at that temperature and the maternal blood is also tested after all these things get tested we know that we've got uh, stem cells which are not only alive uh, okay i'll i'll leave i'll leave that for later uh, we we'll, uh, we'll harvest the stem cells see if they're adequate or not and then we store it in that vapor phase of liquid nitrogen when it is labeled and all and this label mind you is again a cryo label which can withstand a temperature of minus 196 so every time any time you go to take it out you can see the label still bearing the name of the mother and the barcode so it can be scanned taken out and it can be transported so that is basically the story okay so here i have two questions number one for how long can we store like this okay mm. Practically, I'll tell you, the the technology is started in 1988-89. So, how many years has it been? This is 200. This is 2021, and that was 1980. So, two years there. That is 1990-2000. So, this technology is about not more than 30-34 years old, 35, almost 34 years old. So, the first stem cells which was kept. it was kept in small 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 alicots alicots means small portions 30 41 stem cell was processed and it was kept in 30 40 such small small tubes each mm-hmm. year these tubes are brought to normal temperature and okay. their their activity is judged so till date we have got proof practical proof okay. that this cell had been transplanted number 1 number 2 they have done this non transplant but yet a experiment to show mm-hmm. how many cells are alive and how many cells are mm-hmm. capable of making red cells white cells and platelets mm-hmm. that data is available for the last 25 years okay. so 25 years you are sure you can keep the cord right okay. so this is something that we have seen practically till date but yes. you know it could be extended as well right it can be again i'm not getting you again yeah, i'm not getting you i'm saying i'm saying that you know this is the data that we have starting 88 or 89 as you mentioned so there are possibilities that going forward we can also see a longer uh, life term of these stored cells definitely because you know uh, when i'm talking about 1988 89 mm. the stem cell processing technology was not so advanced the right. cryogenic storage the protection from the cold that technology wasn't this advanced 
so this mm -hmm. advancement has taken place in the last 15 years 15 20 years okay. so the stem cells which has been stored in the last 15 20 years have been mm -hmm. very well processed and very well kept so okay. that is important so in no doubt it will do that and number two is mm -hmm. in this new technology there have been certain statistical analysis which has been made what is the statistical analysis again this aligots 15 years ago there had been 15 such same umbilical cord bloods which were thought for the last 15 years and they have they have uh, made a plot to see how the activity of these stem cells reduce and this is known as a statistical regression analysis once they have done this statistical regression analysis the statisticians have said that this can be stored mm -hmm. for n number of years maybe 10000 wow. years the 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 because you know basically once you get these stem cells to be well processed and you make it so cold mm -hmm. the intake of food the requirement of the energy and the excretion and the respiration that means taking in of oxygen and getting out of carbon dioxide in the cellular level almost reaches zero if it reaches zero almost zero then the food requirement is also very less its yes. excreta production will also be very less its oxygen consumption will be less and its carbon dioxide production will also be less so mm -hmm. if all these things are less so they are in a state of sleep mm -hmm. if it is not disturbed right you know, right. there is a very important thing mm -hmm. okay. blood is a drug cord blood is a drug right so when you right. go to buy a medicine mm -hmm. what is the thing you first see if you go to buy a medicine um, if the medicine is correct or not, name, right. composition. Second mm. is, when has this medicine been manufactured and when it is going to go out of date? We call it a date of expiry. Right. expiry. You know, the drugs, director of drugs control, mm. not only director of drugs control India, but mm. even FDA all over the world, this is the uh -huh. only product which doesn't have an expiry. Okay. So you're calling uh, Cord blood as a drug, a, a medicine? Cord blood is a drug. Cord, because we've been licensed by the Directorate of Drugs Control Central and the state. Okay. So it is a drug. Okay. Now, um, as I mentioned, I had two questions on the, that particular conversation. Number one, of course, uh, how long we can store. And the second would be, uh, would it only benefit the child whose umbilical cord blood has been stored? Not really. Okay. If there is there is something you know um, a particular uh, if you talk about any cell, leave around stem cell, mm -hmm. any cell. Today, if you want to, uh, I mean, share cells. Mm -hmm. If my cells go to you, any cell, like mm -hmm. let's say blood, you've got a right. blood group, right? So my yeah. cell, my blood might not be accepted by you, or your blood might not be accepted by me because it is governed by blood. Group. And all these, yeah, but that is yesterday's concept that O positive is accepted by everybody. Today, okay. even O has got the, even there are small breaks up within that. So, yeah, okay, good. If next time I require someone, you can come in. But what happens is that if today there is something as small as blood, it requires grouping to match. Right. If there is a growth of the blood forming organ that we require, or for any other organ, a brain, a heart, a pancreas, it has to match very well. And this matching, you know, happens where each and every cell to show its, its what should I say, itself. Mm -hmm. That means meanness. It is me. Okay. Meanness. So yes. this meanness, mm -hmm. not M E N S E, M E N E S S. Right. The individuality. That it is, is a flag. Yeah, that is a flag. This flag is given by certain proteins which are there on the cells. Mm -hmm. These proteins are known as HLAs. H L A. Human leukocytic antigen. So this human okay. leukocytic antigen has to be a match between the donor and the recipient. So a child whose cord blood has been stored is mm -hmm. 25 to 75 percent match between its siblings. It is at least a 50% match between its parents. 
And it will at least be a 25% match between its grandparents. Okay. And Ittafaq say by accident, it okay. might match anybody in the world. It might. Okay. But that right. is by chance. But yeah. these are the chances of a match. This is, you know, this is another point of umbilical cord blood. Yeah. Umbilical cord blood is collected at birth. So the cells which are still have not finished their journey from the placenta to the baby hmm. are not the adult stem cells. They are theoretically the adult stem cells, but basically they are stem cells who are naive. Hmm. And by virtue of being naive, they do not express certain HNAs. Generally in my career, I have seen they might not express about two to three HNAs. So when I am talking about the major HLA match, there is a major, there is a match because the number of HLAs are like the constellation of the stars. So many HLA types are there. But there are major HLAs like HLA A, B, C and D. And D has got three classifications. Okay. So basically there are five to six types of HLAs which we talk about as major. Now, if a person is an adult donating a bone marrow or donating a peripheral blood stem cell unit, it has to be a full match. Okay. Because it's an adult. All the HLAs are expressed. Whereas in umbilical cord blood, by virtue of being a few HLAs not being expressed, mm -hmm. not because it's not there, it is, mm -hmm. it is there, but because of the naivety, because of the immaturity of these mm -hmm. cells, because they haven't yet made their journey into the body of the fetus, of the baby. It is still trapped. So I've taken it out from there. So yeah. they're not mature. So they express a few HLAs which are less. Let's say if it is two HLAs that are less, mm -hmm. if there are 10 HLAs to be matched, so two HLAs are not present. Mm -hmm. So the chances of matching becomes 20% higher because now you go to match only eight out of the 10 because the two are not present. Mm -hmm. So that is how an umbilical cord blood sometimes becomes a more match. I, you didn't you didn't get my point or did you get it? What are you wondering? No, actually, um, yeah, I was just about to tell you that to just, you know, simplify it, HLAs are important to match for any treatment. And uh, as families are close, both genetically, of course, uh, the chances of having the family get treated is higher because of the genetic uh, or and also the HLA matching that you explained in the beginning. So, yes, so by storing your cord blood, you're not just protecting the child, but you're also somehow getting an insurance for your family it, or blood family to be precise. Am I correct? Absolutely. Because currently, you know, there is some type of a transplant which has been uh, pretty successful over the last 10 years is known as a haploidentical transplant. In a haploidentical transplant, we actually transplant a 50% match uh, stem cells. Mm -hmm. from bone marrow or from peripheral blood. So if you okay. get your stem cells from umbilical cord blood, mm -hmm. blood identical transplant will become like a three-fourth identical. So the chances of matching and the chances of having this problems post-transplant is much lower. Okay. okay. Right. And uh, two questions we heard from uh, you know, our existing or whoever we connected with basically, we had this doubt that since there are some dead genetic diseases that get transferred, you know, uh, with generations. Here, if a mother is already a carrier of thalassemia, will the child be affected and will, will the stem cell uh, or the stem cell can be collected from there? I have asked you two, three questions in one. So if That's you okay. can simplify it and, you know, help I'll, us understand. I'll, I'll tell you. Firstly, I am a bit uh, off when you said the mother is a carrier. Okay. Because in in my in my uh, lectures, I uh -huh. with the already very bad uh, light in which females are shown in our society. Okay. In my life, I had never uttered the word female as our carriers because it gives the lay people an impression that only females are. So okay. But yes, okay, if let me take it this if a father is a carrier, right, it doesn't matter on the father or the mother if any one of them is a carrier, they cannot transmit this disease. 
both of them have to be carriers and only then 25% of the pregnancies may result in such a disorder like thalassemia or hemoglobin abnormality it's like they see a carrier is a person who's got one gene which is normal and mm -hmm. one gene which is defective so let's say this is the defective gene and this is the normal gene so this is another part of the spouse with whom again one gene is defective so now the children will get a combination of these four genes or the four uh, traits so the person who gets this and this will be normal the individual who gets this and this will be normal anyone who gets this and this will be a carrier anyone who gets this and this will also be a carrier but the unfortunate who's going to get these two will be a patient so in each and every case when one of the parents is a carrier it cannot produce that thing point 1 point 2 if unfortunately they are both carriers and they have not been counseled nothing has been done they unfortunately within that 25% that have they have given birth to a baby who is suffering from cancer okay so the best way for this is there are two ways to deal with it one is you stored the umbilical cord blood no you got a thalassemic child in the family hmm. now you go for a second pregnancy in a second pregnancy you can do something known as a prenatal diagnosis in a prenatal diagnosis you make sure that the child is normal and you can also make sure that the child is having an hla matched sibling right. that baby is carried forward till term baby is delivered the umbilical cord blood is collected this umbilical cord blood is stored and after some time after about one and a half to two years this umbilical cord blood stem cells is transplanted into the original person who is suffering okay. okay so by that way you can cure the disorders like thalassemia and sickle cell in fact for cord life we've done about quite a few transplants where the mm -hmm. brother's cord blood was used by the elder brother the sister's cord blood mm -hmm. was used by the elder sister or elder brother like that and we've got a very good transplantation record okay so that is yes. Uh, okay um i have just one more question and then we can start taking questions from the audiences um the amount of stem cell that has been collected through the cord blood uh, is that sufficient for treatment of an adult body okay this question has been asked to me i don't know how umpteen number of times mm -hmm. what is best in darjeeling if you go to darjeeling what is best well um, what do you think of other than kanchanjunga when you go to darjeeling well i i love the uh, you know the hills and mountains and, there and, and and what grows on the hills oh yeah the tea the most important yes tea. i love the uh, so is tea native of india no initially no no initially means it was never a yes yeah, because the britishers had actually taken tea from china and planted it in the darjeeling hills hmm. so do you think they bought the the britishers brought in gardens of tea gardens from uh, china to india or they just bought one sapling one sapling correct now what has happened to the darjeeling hills it's got guard tea gardens it started right. from where one sapling so you know the concept of stem cell lies in realizing that mm -hmm. there is something known as a stem cell multiplication capacity or clonal expansion capacity where one stem cell can give rise to at least 32 such stem cells so one mother cell can give rise to 32 daughter cells in generations that means one becomes two two becomes four four becomes eight eight becomes 16 16 becomes 32 so that it that is how it multiplies so the umbilical cord blood just by having a sheer number of cells which are limited because you know the um, num the amount of cord blood which is kept in the umbilical cord after the delivery of the baby is again limited but it contains uh, so to say some grandmother cells i was talking about mother cells here i'll say some grandmother cells grandmother giving birth to mothers mother giving birth to daughters so you can have plenty of cells coming out from that that is very important number 2 is while doing a transplant the dose of cell differs 
from a malignant to a non malignant disorder. What is the issue is that it can be used depending on the amount of stem cells which had been stored. Number three right. is if there is, we are talking about a malignancy or something, the child or the person due to a chemotherapy and others becomes so cachectic that their body weight might be sufficient to take or to get transplanted using the stem cells from the umbilical cord blood itself. There has been records of it, there has been papers. And lastly, you know, uh, me sitting as one of the technical and directors of Cord Life, Cord Life has tied up uh, with a very good research where the stem cells are being expanded, the number of stem cells are being increased, keeping the stemness intact. It's known as an ex vivo expansion technology, which is being done in collaboration with the National Institute, the University of Singapore and Singh Health, where Cord Life is a part of it. And this is going to take another two years, this clinical trial. And once this becomes a reality, which we are very hopeful, we'll be able to expand the number of stem cells that is present in the umbilical cord blood today. So it is not going, this question is not going to arise anymore. Right. So I think I have answered yes. those questions. Right. Anything else? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I have another, again another last question that would be very important before um, any person or any family goes ahead and choose, uh, chooses a bank. So according to you, what should be the criteria? How a common family can choose or decide to choose a bank? Okay, the most important part of choosing a bank, there are two things, you know. To me, the most important is you might have the very best of technology, you might have the very best of everything. But the financial stability of a particular cord, uh, cord blood bank is very important because the relationship today you have started with an umbilical cord blood banking is going to continue for a minimum of 21 years. And these people have should have a financial stability to carry you through to at least 21 years. That is point one. And point two is they should have a very good insurance policy. Anything that goes wrong should be compensatable. Should be compensatable. These two are very important. Number three, once a person has their number three, another, I think it's relatively, I don't know if it should be coming at point one or point three, that is transparency. Transparency to me means you should have everything on the desk, every question that a particular prospective person who wants to store cord blood should be able to, we should be able to answer them. Like, is there a technology by which the umbilical cord blood and the maternal blood is transported at two different temperatures? Is there a technology present where the maximum amount of stem cells, umbilical cord blood can be harvested at the initiation stages? Because, you know, there are plenty of banks who use a 150 ml cord blood. And in my career of cord blood banking, which has spanned over, let's say about, it's going on to two decades almost in India. Uh, I have seen umbilical cord blood, which is collected, which is about 175 plus mLs. If it is 175 plus mL, naturally a bag which cannot collect more than 150 mL is naturally wasted. You know why? Because the anticoagulant, which is supposed to keep the blood in a fluid state, is always less. So the blood is going to clot. If the blood clots, it is going to take the stem cells with it. So you're not equipped to uh, collect more than 150 ml of cord blood. So does anyone have a bag which is capable of collecting more? Doesn't depend on you. But you also cannot predict how much your harvest will be. You'd be very happy to have a 3.5 kg baby. A 3.5 kg baby might be giving a 175 plus ml of cord blood. So if a person is equipped with a 150 ml cord blood collection bag, the person will never be able to collect the 100, uh, anything that's 151th that one ml will also not be collected. So the harvest will always be low. So the harvest while collecting, number two, two different temperatures of transportation. Three, the receptacle that is used today, the box, in the time of COVID, are you doing away with the box? Are you throwing it away? Are you destroying it? Or are you reusing it? Anyone reusing a collection box to me should be a question mark with a capital Q. Because then my I would want to see how is that box being sterilized? I want to see the certificate. 
because I wouldn't let any one of my children's cord bloods to be transported in something which had performed this thing before. It had had a journey from the, to a particular person's house to the hospital. From the hospital, it has taken a courier and come to the cord blood bank and all these things have been done. So, do you ask for a sterility certificate of a box during this particular process if it is being if it is being reused, or they tell you, "Yeah, I destroy it." Number four, if all these things have been done, is there a no X-ray certificate? Ask for a no X-ray certificate because an X-ray actually can damage the cells in a very defective way, make them transform them into malignant cells. You won't even know it, so it is passing through the X-ray. Not possible. Number four. Are they doing a uh, anyone who is doing a let's say a harvest of stem cells processing? Mm. You know, I might have a fight with my wife early in the morning. I come to the processing chamber in a very foul mood. I'm a human being. I try to process. I'll hit an 88 percent, 88 percent of recovery. I'm in a very good mood. I hit 98 percent, 99 percent. But to me, is that 88 percent justified? No. When I start processing from the morning, even if I am the best of mood, till the end of the day, obviously my harvest percentage goes down. Do we look at it? So automated processing. If there is a robot, a robot might not be able to hit ninety-eight, ninety-nine percent, but it is ensured that the robot will all the time hit ninety-five percent. So if you process it through an automated technology, mm. the it's harvest is standardized. No one is making it. No one is made an exception. Very important. After that, if you cool it down, can you cool it down? Has that report been given to that it has been cooled down well? Very important. After the cord blood has been processed, we don't know how many cells are. We always ask the question, sir, how many cells are alive? What is the viability? Mm -hmm. Today, in the era of COVID, we have seen plenty of people on a respirator, on a ventilator. They are also alive. And you are outside the you are outside the door. You are also alive. So what's the difference between you and the patient and the person and the patient on the ventilator? Both of them are alive. So can we differentiate between a cell who is on the ventilator and a cell who is alive and kicking? A cell which is alive and kicking can give you a special report. That report is known as the clonal expansion capacity. Can this cell today multiply from one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to sixteen, sixteen to thirty, to thirty-two to sixty-four? Does it happen? Is there a proof? Number one, number two, I will take that this particular cell will minimally reconstitute my blood. That means it will make red cells, white cells, and platelets. Can this people give me proof that this particular unit which I have stored on behalf of my child can produce red cells, white blood cells, and platelets? It is known as CFU assay. Is this CFU assay being done? If I ask for. These quality parameters has to be looked into very, very, very well. So all these things you should think. Like people should not think of the monetary part of it. You know, the money people pay is for quality. You cannot get any shoe on the footpath which will compare a Reebok. So if you wear, if you want to wear a Reebok or an Adidas, you'll have to pay for it. Even with a sixty percent discount that the Reebok or Adidas gives. It can never be compared with a shoe that is sold on the footpath. Cannot. Absolutely. So you've got to be sure what you. I mean, what you want. So everything comes at a price. Sure, sir. Now we are uh, taking some questions from the audiences. Uh, Ravi has a question. Um, he wants to know how stem cells are uh, used for treatments. What is the medical process? If you could just. Uh, Give some light I will give you the example of a. I'll give you the example of a stem cell transplantation. What happens is during the transplantation, the mother tissue, who we know is already diseased, hmm. may it might be a malignancy, it might be a disorder like thalassemia or whatever. We hmm. admit this person first. The person is kept in a room which is known as a HEPA filtered room. HEPA means high efficiency particulate air filter, such that the outside bacteria, funguses, and viruses. Are filtered to ninety nine point nine nine percent, and they cannot enter this room. Then this person is fitted with a catheter through and through this catheter and other peripheral veins. The person has is given very intensive chemotherapy. 
through this intensive chemotherapy the diseased cells are made to die they are killed after that they are flushed out of the cavity mm. with another injection so slowly the cell number comes down till it reaches virtual zero but as i told you the red cells are supposed to transport oxygen the white cells are supposed to fight infection and the platelets are supposed to make the blood clot if there is any rent in a vein or an artery or somewhere so these three functions will suffer immensely so what happens is the red cells are replaced by transfused red cells ui we donate blood so those red cells are going to go ui who donate blood the platelets from us will also go and make it up but we cannot give white cells for white cells it is to fight infection so to fight infection we give antibacterials that is antibiotics antivirals for the viruses antifungals for the fungus infections and we also give ready made agents which are known as immunoglobulins so these are given together slowly we wait for this particular cell come to come down to zero what happens is that a cell which has been kept in a cord blood bank they take or we also take a minimum of 7 to 10 working days for this to be transported at that particular temperature so ideally this thing should be transported to the transplantation center at least 72 hours before that day zero where the cell count is going to become zero at the time when it is zero everything is ready the unit is there but it is frozen solid so this frozen solid unit of umbilical cord blood is actually thawed between 6 to 15 minutes to raise the temperature to 37 degrees celsius which is near your body temperature then it is transfused through the peripheral vein peripheral vein or through the central vein it is transfused into that person it is actually a transplant but it is it's the bone marrow transplant because it goes into the bone marrow but we do not drill into the bone marrow and put it there it goes through the peripheral vein and after that this person stays in the hepa filter room in a non infective atmosphere and slowly these stem cells grow into other type of cells when we see such mature cells in peripheral circulation we know that the transplant has been successful and then slowly this person is made to go outside and is exposed to the external environment that is how okay. it works okay okay you know uh, we have uh, another channel uh, akash who is asking us um which is the best stem cell bank and what makes god life special Hmm. Which is the best stem cell bank? You know, me sitting on this chair, I'll always say uh, this stem cell bank I made with my own two hands. So I'll always, I'll never criticize my own child. So this is my child. This is the best bank I can tell you. But again, it is for you to judge. What I have told you is the ways to judge a stem cell bank: financial stability, transparency, the services given. Go through the rules which are there, and after you've gone through the rules, you will actually know. which is the stem cell bank you want to choose you know we have got a very bad habit we are all googlers we google best stem cell bank and have you ever wondered that whenever i type something some name comes at the top how that is done it is done through advertisements there is a small bracket which says ad that means because of a sheer advertisement or money power that has come that thing has come to the top do ignore it go to the actual brass tax go to the actual bank you want to study go to a non sponsored website then you judge for yourself or best is i think you will get all get our numbers whenever you want it will be shared with you you call up people see for yourself who can give you the best and the transparent service and it is not that money which always matters because this is the future that you are story yes sir so. and i would also request you to talk about our lab um you know the kind of infrastructure we have so if you could elaborate on that okay our lab is one of the i mean it is situated on a two bighas of land two bigha actually i don't know how much in square feet that is and it has got a floor area it is about four floors each floor area is about 3700 to 4000 square feet and uh, we've got a continuous power supply so we've got two generators and the two generators are backed up by two upss as that there is uninterrupted power in the whole lab and uh, now that the uh, the entire cord blood banking banking actually depends on how much of liquid nitrogen you have so currently we've got a huge liquid nitrogen tank in our premises 
which through a pipeline known as vacuum insulated pipeline, this pipeline supplies uninterrupted liquid nitrogen to all our tanks. And all our tanks run on a particular logic, which is known as OFAF. That OFAF means one fill, all fill. So there is a uh, servant, there is a slave and a master. So anytime the master's nitrogen goes down, goes down means it goes down to a level. We have never let the temperature go down to below minus 190. Once it hits minus 190, immediately triggers a fill. And this fill trigger is an automated fill trigger. No one can override it. So it is automatically going to suck liquid nitrogen. While the master has filled itself, it asks its slaves, do you require nitrogen or not? If they require nitrogen, whatever nitrogen there is required to be topped up, it is getting topped up. And it, this logic goes on for all the tanks that are connected by the software system. And you know, every time each and every one of these tanks is connected to something known as a lab monitoring system. This lab monitoring system every half an hour sends us a message about the lower and the higher temperature of each tank. You'd be wondering why am I talking about a lower and higher temperature? Because each of these tanks, by the way, I'm 5 feet 10 inches tall. Sorry, 5 feet 11. So the tank is taller than me. So if you have a rack which is running through the length of this tank, there is bound to be a temperature difference between the top and the bottom. But luckily, the tanks that we use do not have a temperature gradient. So, but every time we measure the temperature on the above and below. Why? Because anytime we open the tank, due to we want to put in new samples at that point of time, the temperature at the top will slowly rise. And we won't let it rise more than 190. So as soon as it reaches 190, there will be an alarm that this lid will close. So for these reasons and for the liquid nitrogen level, all these alarms comes to us every half an hour. And if there is any problem, immediately we know what is there. Mind it, these tanks don't come cheap. And in our lab, we've got one such spare tank. And this spare tank is able to tackle at least one more tank's capacity. So we've got a capacity which is kept aside for an emergency. Again, mm -hmm. buying a tank, filling it continuously with liquid nitrogen without any samples in it comes at a cost. Why do we do it? We do it for you. If there is some hassle, we know there might not be anything, but still this is a fallback. Mm -hmm. and we've got, despite these overhead pipes, we've got small, small containers which contain around 250 liters of liquid nitrogen each. There are six such containers in the laboratory. If this supply from the big tank also gets interrupted, these six tanks can take care of it. Again, in the processing room, we've got a class C clean room, which is validated every, every month. And the bio burden is measured at least every four hours. That means how much of particle count is there. And then only the processing is done. If the bio burden doesn't cross a particular limit, I mean, doesn't stay below a particular limit. Processing is prohibited for that day. Hasn't happened, touch wood. But all those precautions are taken. It's very important. And once all these things are done, all the instruments that we use for the processing, all the instruments are calibrated. Calibrated at proper time. Sometimes it is calibrated four times a year. We run calibrators and controls for every one of, before each and every run, to see that the machines are working properly. And you know, there is something known as a pre-analytical error. That means you collect a blood. Today I was pointing out to you, Priyanka, remember? You, that person right. collected this blood. But though this was not for cord life, uh, cord blood yeah. or something, right. little less blood was collected. And this little less blood actually can have a huge impact in the post-analytics. So we make sure the samples that come to us are in the best of the market vials, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it is transported at the correct temperature. If you do not transport it at the correct temperature, what happens? All that we measure, the hepatitis B, C, HIV, all these antigen, antibody, serological reactions that we measure, all these are proteins. All these proteins have got a, have got a chance of getting, undergoing denaturation. That means it might not reflect what it is. So the entire assay might go haywire. So to keep all these things intact, these are the precautions that we have. And of course, the other safety measures are also there, the fire protection and all that. We are earthed in a particular earthquake-proof building. Um, I know when the foundation was laid, 
we actually had a 82 feet piling. So in an 82 feet piling, it was something like this, a triangle was created. So there was a pile here, there was a pile here, and there was a pile here. And these, these tie beams were done. From these tie beams, there are verticals which were constructed from each of these arms. And the main pillar has come from the center point of this triangle. So virtually the center point of the pillar can distribute weight into three pillars. So this is how this building was conceived and it was created. So though we uh, lie in a seismically prone area, we are pretty protected. We have done the best we can. Right. Uh, here we can also mention about the accreditations that we have earned and also we uh, the lab is uh, regularly audited by the international bodies. So that something is very crucial. That is like, you know, uh, to me, uh, accreditations today is like a hygiene factor. But then some normal, uh, you know, common masses, they need to realize that for so important. many years, like the American, uh, the first we were ISO certified. The first we got the license from the Drug Control General of India and the State of West Bengal uh, Drug Control Board. After that, we got an ISO certification. After the ISO certification, we thought, okay, uh, let's do an ABB, American Association of Blood Bank certification. So we got that accreditation that has been with us for the last uh, 10 years. So this year, the fifth uh, certification audit went on so smoothly. After that, we thought, okay, uh, the cord blood banking has been certified. Let us do something. There is something known as a good manufacturing practice, which is the GMP. So we went in for a WHO GMP certification. And we got the WHO GMP certification that has been with us for the last, again, I guess, about 10 years. And then uh, we thought that FDA registered. Also, we require ourselves to get FDA registered. So we got FDA registration also. After that, uh, we thought... Um, the diagnostics part on which we are doing the test for the maternal blood and the quality control of the umbilical cord blood, that also should be certified. So once we went into that, we got a College of American Pathologist certification for all the tests and the cord blood processing that we do. After that came in the term, we, again, uh, it was like ISO 15189, that is the NABL certification, let us do. So we did the NABL certification. And with the NABL certification came in the ILAC certification. So ILAC NABL certification, I think our uh, the bottom of the pad has almost become filled up. I, don't, I can't think of anyone which we can do. But definitely, I'd, I'd be setting the standard a bit higher. We have proposed that we want to do it a bit more. Uh, though this, and you know, in COD Life, it is never a holiday for you. Actually, the COD Life team, uh, we've got... You know, you know that we've got seven other banks in the entire Southeast Asia. So the quality managers of these seven banks, they come and audit nothing but not their own bank. So we got the Hong Kong people coming here and auditing us. We got the Singapore people come here and coming here and auditing us. So every year we get about three such audits, which are from offshore audits. And these are neutral audits. And my people also go to other, uh, to other uh, countries uh, court life facilities and audit them as a third party auditor and this is very strict audit so the findings are discussed so this is how we try to maintain standards throughout the seven court blood banks that we have in the entire southeast asia and um, I'm, I'm i'm smiling you know because i forgot to tell you about the accreditations and the certifications because it never occurred to my mind that a certification and accreditation is something uh, that you can show off it is something like you should feel in your heart I mean, it is something which I, I told you it's a hygiene factor. So mm -hmm. if you are not there, you're not there. This is the you know, I would say it a movie movie. Consider, considering, you know, the hygiene factor, how yes. my uh, cord bloods are, uh, or, or my, how my child's cord blood is being stored, what are the factors they're maintaining. If, if in future, if I need it, I would be able to retrieve it. And it is a successful one. So, you know, these sort of questions do come to mind and if we have these sort of certifications and accreditations that in a way assures us that our our precious stem cells are in you know safe hands we can trust trust the uh, company trust the brand trust god life so that is something you know at the end of the day priyanka at the end of the day i wouldn't really trust a cake sitting mm -hmm. in the shelf I would like to taste it. Right. So to me, 
the ultimate proof of a bank comes with the reports comes with the cfu assay comes with the other assays that are done anyone like in cod life today has done banking with us can ask for any reports the quality control reports the lj charts anything it's transparent mm -hmm. if they want to see it they can see it i've got no we've got no qualms about it and it is like no one can challenge us sure sir be it whatever it is be it right sir <laughs> well thank you so much you know for all your elaborate explanations it really helped us understand uh, the complex you know which is actually considered complex uh, subject of stem cells and why stem cell banking is important why cord blood banking is the best way to go about it and we got plethora of you know understanding and knowledge from you so i really want to thank you i also thank you the i also want to thank the joinees who have attended us today and uh, for the last moment sir would you like to add something we would want to hear from you mm. okay now uh, after all cord blood is a gift it's a gift of science it's a gift of god mm -hmm. don't throw it away don't throw it away because today an individual might be spending more money on a packet of cigarettes a day than what is required for corporate banking it can save you when the time comes and uh, whichever bank you want to bank with it's entirely up to you but take an informed decision and a judgment but do bank do bank you don't i'm not telling you that because i told you i my child is the fairest even a owl says that i'm not an owl but uh, even i see it i'm not an exception but you judge for yourself but do not do not throw away this gift it might save you sometime when you are at most in need so please bank please bank your card and do go through the things that i thought were relevant because other than being the uh, director and the technical director of cord life i am also a clinician i see patients every day so uh, when i see patients every day i do have a very neutral stand but at that neutral stand even then i cannot control myself but speak of cord life quality assurance so please be assured of that thank you very much thank you for giving thank us you very much, uh, everyone for joining and thank you so much sir so we are signing off now Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. When is a parent born? When your world changes in a moment. Nani. Or when the moment is celebrated by all. When you start learning again. Or with a new rule. Is it your child's first breath? Or is it just a feeling? Parents are born when they fulfill a responsibility. Your child's umbilical cord blood can provide protection from 80 life-threatening diseases. Keep it safe with Asia's largest stem cell bank, Cord Life. One chance, one choice.